What's going on summoners? Welcome back to another Pro Guides video. I'm Kangas and in this video I'll be talking all about mid lane macro. I'll answer all those difficult questions about things like when to push and how to impact the map. So shove that wave, roam the bot lane, and let's get into it. First up, let's talk about laning. There's a big pool of mid laners that you can choose from. Anything from enchanters like Seraphine who like to support their teammates, or assassins like Zed who fish for creative and impactful solo plays. All are viable picks. But depending on who you play, your goals during the laning phase are very different. So the first thing you want to do, obviously, is set a goal. Assess your matchup and think about what's feasible. Of course, every single mid laner should be thinking about trying to scale up. EXP and gold are important to not only pull ahead, but also to not fall too behind. As you gain more experience as a player, you can develop a better sense of what your champion can do during the laning phase. Knowledge in a winning matchup, like if you're playing an assassin versus a scaling mage, could lead you to aiming for a 20 CS lead by the 10 minute mark, or a solo kill by then instead. Before we get into more of that though, we have our question of the day. Who's your favorite mid laner to play? For me, even though he's not always the best, I just love Victor's kit and he's so fun to play. Nothing is as satisfying as just completely one-shotting a wave with a fully leveled up E. But let me know yours in the comments down below. One of the bigger things we see mid laners do is going for too much CS when it's not always safe. A lot of people get stressed out because they think that they have to hit CS benchmarks at certain times, but sometimes you have to think about things comparatively. Aiming for 100 CS by 10 minutes isn't always feasible. If your opponent is constantly trading, or if you're getting camped, you can't possibly get every minion because the CS is not worth dying for. Tunnel visioning on hitting that static goal you've set for yourself can easily bait you into overextending for that cannon minion and dying to a gank. Or you might be really low health, but you think, hey, I'm under my tower so I can farm safely here, but then they just tower dive you. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and reset even if you're missing CS. Or there could be times where you see your opponent overextending for a minion at the same time that one of theirs is low. Instead of farming for that single minion, you can capitalize on their mistake, taking a big chunk out of their health and zoning them off of the next wave. Giving up one minion for lane pressure can lead to a much bigger CS lead, which is arguably more important than actually hitting up CS benchmark. Remember that you're not playing a single player game. Getting as much gold as possible is important, but having the ability to put your opponent behind is another skill that can make a great player. The only times we're setting these sorts of having X minions by X time are okay is when you're playing a farm matchup. Neither of you is capable of feasibly killing the other because you both lack the damage to apply kill pressure. Otherwise, you both might have enough sustain to shrug off any damage or have tools like potions and teleport to help you ignore it instead. Okay, so that was a lot, but essentially once you've established your early game goals, you want to already know what you're going to do with the first minion wave that spawns. This is arguably one of the most important ones as your level 2 and level 6 power spikes are the biggest impact in the mid lane. By the way, if you want to learn about how to get even better at League of Legends, I want you guys to know that we're running a promotion over at ProGuides.com. Until the end of the month, you can use the code RANKUP2021 to get 20% off of your subscription. We've got other resources like coaches too, so go check it out. But in regards to that level 2 power spike, there's a very specific strategy that high elo players will often use. This isn't always the best strategy, but it's a solid one, and I've seen it or a variation of it used in almost every high elo game. When you don't know exactly what to do, this is a solid strategy to default to, and the only requirement is that your matchup is either winning or even at level 1. If it's even, you'll need to go for small outplays and find favorable trades. To summarize, your strategy is slow push the first wave, play aggressively during the level 2 power spike, crash wave 2 or more waves into turret, make a play, thin the wave, and from there, you freestyle it. This is a lot of vague information, so let's break down each step. Slow pushing your first wave is pretty straightforward. Try and trade with your opponent as much as possible. Hitting your opponent will naturally cause your wave to push because you draw minion aggro. Of course, you want to minimize the damage that you take from minions, but the fact that you've caused the enemy minions to switch targets already creates an advantage. Go for the last hits, and if your opponent is pushing the wave, match them, but make sure your pacing is a bit faster. Ideally, you can abuse a strong level 1 or outplay your opponent to trade as much damage as possible. In the case that you manage to take a big chunk of your opponent's HP early, you should be able to either zone them off or take a free solo kill. If you somehow manage to get a solo kill at level 1, the wave might get messed up, but that's okay because hey, you got a free kill. The reason you're slow pushing this wave is to hit your level 2 power spike first and also ensure that you can crash a big wave into your enemy's turret. Next, you play aggressively during your level 2 power spike. Everyone, and I mean everyone that's played League for a while now, knows that you want to go for an all-in at level 2. You have two abilities, and your opponent has one, and you'll win in pretty much every scenario. As you've been slow pushing, pay close attention to your EXP bar. After the first 6 minions die, you get level 2 off of one melee minion. Start moving forward and look for a heavy trade right when you hit level 2. Having a hotkey bounce that you can easily level up an ability makes this easier as well. 
When you do this, your opponent will either back off and concede lane priority, allowing you to proceed with the strategy, or you'll get a ton of damage on your opponent, and sometimes this can also lead to a solo kill. So, let's presume the former. Your opponent's backed off and allowed you to have complete control of the wave. From here, you continue a slow push while zoning your enemy off of the wave. Your goal is now to crash two or more waves into the enemy turret. Odds are that a lot of minions from the first wave are already dead, and based on how much your opponent has tried to push back, your wave might be smaller. The goal is to try and push whatever survivors you have in the wave you're pushing, as well as the upcoming six minions. In most cases, you're pushing in whatever remains of the first minion wave, as well as the majority of the second minion wave. After this crash, you make a play. What that play is depends entirely on you. It's important though, that you do something, anything actually. The whole point of slow pushing was to guarantee that you would create this time for yourself. You can walk into the enemy jungle and war deep to give your team information. If you're ranged, you can play aggressively and further poke your opponent down. This can even force your opponent to base early and use teleport if they're running it. Other times, you might be able to force your opponent to use their potions early. You can also use this time to go for an early cheese roam. As long as you do something with the time, you're already playing like you're in high elo. Finally, you'll thin the wave. Since you've crashed a big wave into the enemy turret, your opponent's next minion wave will stall under their turret, while they help clear your minions. Naturally, this positioning will set up the following minion waves to push into you. Although you can allow your opponent to push back and freeze, thinning the wave and slowing down that push opens up options. If your opponent's already low from your previous poke, the obvious cop-out for them is to push back as hard as possible and go for an early recall. To prevent this, you want to push the wave back and force them to stay. If you thin the wave that's bouncing back, you can decide to either let it slow push to you or to push it back into the enemy's turret. You want control and you want to give your opponent a very hard decision. This is also why the last step is to freestyle it. After you've thinned that wave, you can just do whatever you feel like. If you're on the receiving end of the strategy, you'll want to do what you can to make it harder for your opponent. When they're trying to force a slow push, go for as much free poke as you can. Push back as hard as you can without taking damage and give your opponent a harder time. The most important thing is that you need to minimize the damage that you take. Do damage control and try and make sure that at best, your opponent only comes out with a few minions ahead or a single deep ward. Remember that if someone is using the strategy against you, it's because they're usually in a winning matchup. You are playing from behind in this scenario and just limiting how much of a lead they build is good work. As the laning phase continues, you can continue implementing this sort of strategy, but it'll heavily vary depending on all the factors of the game such as champions, jungle pressure, and whatever the solo queue fiesta brings. Go for trades, slow push waves, and make a play. Next, let's talk about pushing and freezing. Because of its position, the mid lane is one of the strongest roles on the rift. You have easy access to either side lane, and this is why freezing is usually suboptimal. If you're planning on using a freeze, you should plan to use it in the very near future. For example, you want your jungler to gank for you within the next minute, so you freeze the wave and force your opponent to push up to break it. When they're doing this, your jungler comes in from behind, you pick up that takedown, and then you push the wave back into your opponent's turret to either break it or recall. On the flip side, pushing waves is a crucial part of playing the mid lane. There are plenty of reasons for this, the first being that the mid lane turrets are the most important ones in the game. Mid lane is the shortest path to the enemy nexus, and if you have control of the mid lane, it's both easier and safer to take vision control of the jungle. Once a turret breaks, the enemy team can push forward much more aggressively, but if you still have a turret in the mid lane, you can easily retreat to it when your opponents try and force fights. When your opponent roams, you want to capitalize on this as much as possible by pushing for damage on the enemy's turret. You can even call for your jungler too, but when your opponents are staying in lane, pushing allows you to roam yourself or just recall. Side lanes, which are longer, gain a lot more freezes because they're inherently more dangerous to play in. A side laner might freeze their lane, and that could be your cue to capitalize on. Like a jungler, a mid laner needs to be constantly aware of what's happening in the other two lanes. Getting your top laner ahead allows them to leave their lane and make a play either mid or bottom. Getting your bot lane ahead means that you can take dragon control and also have them swap into the mid lane faster. Gather as much information as you can, and if you see opportunities, begin to either slow or fast push your wave. How you decide this depends on your opponent's tendencies and also how quickly you need to move. If you see an enemy low in a side lane and believe that they'll recall soon, your time is short and you want to push as fast as possible. If side laners are healthy and mini waves are in the middle, the odds of the play working out are lower and you can minimize your potential loss by stacking a bigger wave to push in. Information gathering is also incredibly important to do on your opponent, but keep in mind the laning phase is rather short in League of Legends, so you won't have many opportunities to use these reads on your opponent. This means that it's so important to make every chance you do get count. 
Whenever you do something with the wave, pay attention to how your opponent reacts. Would you immediately start running to a side lane without even pushing? Does your opponent push back or do they follow you? When you push in waves, does your opponent concede or fight the push? There are plenty of mind games you can play with roams, but you'll need to think about what your opponent is doing and what information they're giving their teammates. When you roam, always consider the fact that your opponent can and might follow you. Although this won't always work, you can actually try and bait your opponent into following a roam to a side lane, but instead of actually roaming, you can sit in a brush and ambush your opponent. This is something any champion can do, but it's most commonly done when playing an assassin. You drag your opponent away from their turret and then fight them in an isolated 1v1. You can also provide fake information to your opponent. As you finish pushing a wave, you can either fake a recall or even run towards one lane, but then double back to another while out of vision. Fog of War is an important part of League of Legends, and you should always consider what your opponent sees. Even if you know that the bottom river might be warded, that doesn't have to stop you from trying to roam down. The threat of you moving can be enough to force the enemy bot lane to retreat, so you can immediately turn back mid so you don't miss minions. What's even better is if your opponents can't see you, and this is why picking up pink wards is important. If your opponents don't know where you are, there's a ton of pressure that comes with it. Some games and on some champions, you can even switch to a sweeper, especially if you plan on roaming a lot. I'm looking at you Zed and Talon players out there. One more important part about roaming is that it's a way to start the mid game. The mid game will usually start when a turret is broken and players aren't bound to their starting lanes anymore. A good roam can break open a bottom or top lane turret and greatly accelerate the pace of the game. Ultimately, your goal in the mid game is to secure dragons, rift heralds, or even Baron Nasher. These objectives will make closing games out much easier. Remember that your ultimate objective is to somehow break the enemy nexus. Whether this happens through winning a teamfight, securing objectives, or split pushing, the goal is still the same. Earlier, I talked about how mid lane turrets are the most important. You can end games fastest by going down mid because it's the shortest. Sometimes it's not easy to break open the mid lane turret because it's so heavily contested. This is why you should let someone else do the job for you when you're not really suited for it. Usually, I'm talking about your bot lane. Assuming your bot laner is playing a marksman, they'll have a much easier time breaking a turret down, especially during a slow siege. This is also why you usually want to try focusing on the bottom lane, even if you're playing mid. Mid lane's really hard to crack because usually it's just you and maybe your jungler trying to siege it down and you don't do a lot of damage to that turret. Instead, you can focus on freeing your bot lane from their shackles and let them take mid lane for you. As a general rule of thumb, you should always aim to break bottom turret first. The exception would be if you have a top lane that can actually do something with the gold lead. You usually don't want to gank something like an Orn too many times because they're just a tank, they're not going to do much with that. But if you have a Riven top lane or an Aatrox, something that can be aggressive and actually use that gold lead to further their advantage, then you can also consider ganking them and helping them out. So if you find yourself in this position where your bot lane is picking up your mid waves, you'll inevitably need to side lane at some point. Usually, it's your job as a mid laner to catch waves that are crashing in bottom or top. Many mid laners have excellent wave clear or are self-sufficient enough to survive side lanes later on. How quickly you can clear a wave is very important, especially if you need someone to go to bottom. The reason for this is bottom lane is the furthest from Baron Nasher, which is heavily contested in the mid to late game. If your champion can clear waves faster, you can also begin rotating faster as well. Always pay attention to every lane and make sure you're not stacking up in the same lane as the rest of your team. Ideally, you'll want to continue farming minions in all three waves so that you don't fall behind as a team. As a mid laner, you can also split push. Mid laners are solo laners, so you'll often be higher level than most of your opponents. You'll also have a ton of gold and can win or at least contest 1v1s. Champions that especially excel at split pushing are assassins. Not only do they win most 1v1s, they're also incredibly mobile. In cases where your opponents try and survive and stop a split push, being able to survive and waste time is crucial. Before you commit to split pushing though, there are going to be times where you'll need to group with your team to get vision control. Play around your vision, and if the entire enemy team is trying to gank you, that's a signal for your team to now start Baron. And that brings us to the final mid lane macro point I'll talk about, Baron Nasher. This guy is incredibly good at closing games out, but he's also the ultimate bait. But that can also be in a good way, like baiting the enemy team, and hopefully not yours. Not every mid laner wants to split push, and a lot actually prefer team fighting. But team fights don't always magically appear in front of you. While mid lane ARAMs are pretty popular in North America, they become less frequent as you climb higher and higher. Instead, there needs to be more incentive for players to take a fight. Baron Nasher is the objective that will usually lead a team to victory, and therefore, players heavily prioritize it. Make sure that you are also prioritizing this objective. Play for vision control around this objective, and hopefully you've broken a couple mid lane turrets by the late game so you can walk that mid lane in and then go into the enemy jungle. You can fake Baron, start up Baron and get off of it, or even try and burst it down. It all comes down to what your team is capable of and how your opponents react. At the end of the day, you can use Baron Nasher to force your opponents to come to you, and at that point, you're getting your team fight. 
Always remember, summoners, the shortest way to your target is through a straight line. NARAM isn't just a habit, it's a lifestyle. But anyway, that'll wrap up our video on mid lane macro. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe and also check out our description for a link to join our Discord. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, though, hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. That's right, Nate. I stole your outro. What you gonna do? Thank <laughs> you.